Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Welcome to the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. This is the oldest think tank in Pakistan and probably the oldest think tank in the developing world. It was set up in 57. And as you can see from the brochure in front of you, it has a long history and many, many things that you've done, including, I was just telling Aziza, including contributing <coughs> to Bangladesh and including contributing to the 22 families slogan in Pakistan. So here you get a long check in history. And uh, when Rauf suggested that we do a think tank on um, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and with Michael here, I took up the opportunity and said, uh, yes, of course, PAD uh, is a development economics institute, so development includes everything, including foreign policy, and much of our development uh, sort of depends on foreign policy. So I welcome this opportunity to have this round table and where our job is mainly to learn from new people. So I'll let Rauf take over the proceedings and we shall proceed from there. I think much grateful to you. I think it's, uh, you know, we, we, we were very short in time, you know, and you came to our rescue and uh, offered all uh, your facilities. So. Grateful to you. Very what grateful. Pleasure. Uh, my pleasure to welcome my friend Michael Kugelman here. And uh, I'm also grateful to him because when I brought this up with him, uh, he was very kind to say yes, I would love to do it. So here he is. And we're going to learn from his wisdom and his insights because he has been traveling widely. He was in India uh, before coming here. So there was much interaction there. So I'd like to be enriched on, on his experiences in India. Now that, and he went to Karachi and now he is here in uh, Islamabad. Uh, there are two things happening here basically. You know, we have tension, Pakistan has tension on its eastern border with India, which is, which, is, which is a traditional thing. It has been there ever since you know, we came into existence in 1947. But unfortunately of late, because the multiple things happening both in our country and mostly in India, uh, the tensions have escalated. So we would like, like him to tell us something about it because I read the uh, front page in the Express Tribune yesterday in which he predicted that India and Pakistan are going to have a war in 2020. Mm -hmm. So you will have to defend that, sir. Uh, and uh, the other thing is our western border. Uh, uh, the Americans and the mm -hmm. Taliban are trying hard to come to a reconciliation. Uh, it, it, at times it, it appears to be imminent, at times it appears to be that <coughs> fairly uh, elusive thing. So we would like to be debating that. And what is going to be the impact, the combined impact of the east tension on the eastern border and tension on the western border and the, and the prospective developments in both countries, Afghanistan and India, on the situation in Pakistan? And how is Pakistan going to tackle it in the short and the long term? So with this short introduction, once again, I, I'm grateful to the team. So I hand, hand it over to to Michael. The subject that we have here before us is that with ongoing developments in Afghanistan and tension brewing between India and Pakistan, what are the prospects of reconciliation and peace in the region? So we shall have uh, input from Michael and after that we will have your comments and questions from you which of course he will respond to. Thank you. Over to you Michael. Well, thank you. I'm very fortunate to be flanked by uh, two good friends here uh, this afternoon. Uh, so thank you, uh, Nadim, for, for hosting this, for um, having you over to your uh, wonderful facilities here, and congratulations on your on your appointment here. I know that Pied is in, is in good hands. Uh, I think we all know that Nadim is an unflinching optimist. So, uh, <laughs> And I also wanted to thank um, my good friend, Ralph Hassan, uh, who's been a partner in crime for quite some time. Uh, the most, one of the most successful Wilson Center programs in recent years has been a, a track two dialogue on U.S.-Pakistan relations for which uh, RPI, uh, Ralph's organization, was our wonderful Pakistani partner. Um, so it's great to see you again, Ralph, and thank sure. you for, for inviting me here. Um, so, so I've been asked to talk about prospects for peace and reconciliation in the region, particularly looking at the Afghanistan bit and looking at the India-Pakistan uh, bit. And I should say the, uh, the, the headline you referred to in the Express Tribune, I'm not quite sure the headline got it right. Uh, it was based on a, a TV interview I had done for Express News in which um, I had said, or I believe I had said, that um, you know, we're at a greater chance of some type of, for, we're at a greater chance of there being some type of conflict between India and Pakistan this year than 
uh, for quite a few years, but I did not predict that there would necessarily be a war this year. I certainly <laughs> hope that um, there isn't one. Um, so first, I start with Afghanistan. My main argument is that prospects for peace and reconciliation are quite remote in the near to midterm. Um, I don't think that should be too much of a surprise. Focusing on Afghanistan first, um, uh, there may be a deal between the U.S. and the Taliban. Uh, as I understand it, the only real obstacle at this point is over the issue of violence reduction. Uh, the Taliban has pledged to reduce violence before a deal is concluded with the U.S., but the U.S. government wants there to be a, something further than it. it, wants there to be a full ceasefire. Uh, now, I would argue that the Taliban may well not agree to accept a full ceasefire. Uh, I think we all could agree that violence really is leverage for the Taliban and it won't want to surrender its most powerful tool of leverage. And even if there is a deal, even if there is a, an agreement between the two sides, um, it won't end the war. It will only set Afghanistan on a path to launch a formal peace process among the Taliban and other Afghans. And I would argue that there are some major, major obstacles to launching, much less concluding a successful peace process. And in that regard, you know, I would argue that a deal, a bilateral deal between the U.S. and the Taliban would be the easiest part, the easier part of this whole process. It would be the low-hanging fruit. And that's saying something, given how difficult it has been to get a deal between the U.S. and the Taliban, even though they've made a lot of progress over the last year plus. So, you know, what do I mean by this? What are the major obstacles to launching a formal successful peace process. One is just this, for lack of a better term, the mess, the political mess in Afghanistan right now. Um, as, as I think you all know, there's an ongoing uh, extended election crisis. Um, you know, there was a presidential election in September. The final results have still not been announced. The preliminary results were announced some time ago. Um, the pre preliminary results found that Ashraf Ghani had won by a very narrow majority, barely over the 50% needed to avoid a runoff between him and Abdullah. But those are only the preliminary results. And as we're told, uh, officials in Afghanistan are still working through the process uh, to try to get to a formal, uh, to, to get the formal results out. Who knows when those will be announced, if ever. Uh, and there are also very deep divisions within the political class uh, in Afghanistan. And I think for these reasons, it will be very hard to do something as simple as forming a negotiating uh, team, especially when there's no government in place, or especially when the government is, is the status of the government is unclear in Afghanistan. Um, another point, getting to the issue of, of, of obstacles to getting a formal peace process going in Afghanistan, is that the, the questionable commitment of the Taliban to peace. Uh, if U.S. troops leave Afghanistan, the Taliban would have a very significant battlefield advantage <coughs> and an opportunity to overthrow the government by force. Uh, also, any negotiation would be meant to lead to a power-sharing deal, including the Taliban. And I think an important question to ask is, uh, would the Taliban actually be willing to work within a political system uh, and to share power within a system that it has long sought to destroy and overthrow? Um, you know, would it really want to share power with those it has long rejected? And I, I'm not sure if these questions have been sufficiently answered. If you accept the Taliban's position at face value, that all it wants, it wants to get the foreign invaders out, it wants all the Americans out. After all the foreign uh, forces are gone, then it will be ready to talk to the government and work out a peace deal. If you take that at face value, then you could be optimistic, but I'm not sure we should go so far. I think there's reason to be skeptical. Um, now, even if there is a peace deal, if, even if there is a comprehensive deal that ends the war, um, the violence certainly would continue. Uh, Taliban, of course, is maybe the most powerful and prominent perpetrator of violence in Afghanistan, but there are others, too, outside the peace process. You know, the ISIS uh, branch in South Asia, <coughs> ISIS Khorasan, ISIS K, it would not be party to any type of peace deal. Uh, and then you could also have a, a situation where the more hardline Taliban, uh, who may reject a peace deal and may decide to jump ship and join the ISIS, uh, join ISIS in Afghanistan. And there are just so many other violent factions in, in Afghanistan, uh, you know, many of them tied to, to the Afghan government, uh, tied to, to the United States. Um, and also, even if there's a deal, even if there's a comprehensive uh, peace deal, it could well collapse, if, especially <coughs> if the effort to reintegrate Taliban fighters into society doesn't work. That's a huge thing, this issue of reintegration. If the Taliban does agree to stop fighting and join some sort of power-sharing deal, how do you get all these folks, uh, how do you disarm them, 
How do you get them to agree to join society and not just keep up the fight? Um, moving to the other issue, India-Pakistan. This is, of course, very tense. Um, neither side, in my view, has a political incentive to identify and pursue off-ramps for the tensions right now. Talking about India first, and as I think Ralph mentioned before, I was in New Delhi before I came here. Uh, I had a number of conversations with people uh, both inside and outside the government. And what, what really strikes me about these, you know, the experience in India and just sort of reflecting on how things have been there over the last few weeks and months is that a hard line on Pakistan, an aggressive position on Pakistan, really pays off politically these days in India. Um, and you know, this, is, this is what happened in the 2019 election. Of course, the, the, the Modi government used the Balakot strikes very politically on the campaign trail. And the government there believes that one reason why it received, why it was re-elected with such a large mandate, even larger than the mandate it received in 2014, was because it had been tough on Pakistan and continued to be tough on Pakistan on the campaign trail. Um, in New Delhi is, is certainly intensifying its Hindu nationalist agenda. Uh, and I really think there's no place in that agenda for proposing conciliation with Pakistan, certainly not within the near to midterm. And you know, Indian politicians within the BJP, they really are using every forum possible to blast uh, Pakistan. Um, you know, the, the, the Delhi state election uh, campaign was in its final days when I was there. And I was struck that you had so many, B when BJP folks were making speeches, they kept bringing up Pakistan. Now what does Pakistan have to do with the New Delhi state election? Not that much, one would think, but mm -hmm. kept bringing it up and, and bashing Pakistan because it, it, it pays off politically uh, these days. I think that we should not expect a so-called Nixon goes to China moment. In other words, the idea of Modi, the hardliner, um, fortified by his support from his rank and file, taking the bold step of reaching out to the enemy. Um, it's not going to happen. At least it's not going to happen anytime soon. And that's because you, know, you could argue that it already did happen. This is certainly what the Indians would say, um, that early in his first term, uh, Prime Minister Modi reached out to Pakistan. He, of course, he went to Lahore. Um, and then after that came Patankot and Uri, and you know, New Delhi believes that its efforts to extend an olive branch backfired badly. Um, and you know, I think that for India, to, to use a, a uh, I guess an American expression, is that this is a case of once bitten, twice shy. You know, they're really going to hesitate to do something again after feeling that they they really got hurt in a big way the first time. Turning to things here, um, <clears throat> I, I think we all know and would agree that uh, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Khan, has quite a few personal ties and connections to India. Um, he, ex he, he himself then extend, extended an olive branch to India early on in this term, just like Modi had done. But I, I think the Article 370 repeal changed everything. It changed the entire uh, calculus completely. First, it would seem to me that it would be very politically risky uh, for Pakistan to respond to such a provocative move as, as perceived by Pakistan by offering conciliation now of all times. A second point, uh, I think that it, Pakistan's main motivation for seeking dialogue with India in, in previous years has really been taken away. I mean, for so long it has sought talks to get Kashmir, India administered Kashmir, on the table. But now India has formally taken J&K off the table by incorporating it into a union territory. And it has said, the Indian government has said, that if there to be any future talks with Pakistan about Kashmir, they would be about POK, as they put it. I'm putting that in quotes. Uh, Pakistan administered Kashmir. And this is, this is huge. This is a really big deal, a, a big change. Um, and with tensions unlikely to ease anytime soon, I think that a single triggering event could produce a crisis and potentially a limited conflict, not a war per se, but a limited conflict that I think would be much harder to de-escalate than the Pulwama Balako crisis. And that, I think, is because the relationship is so much tenser now than it was a year ago, and that's because of the, uh, the Article 5 uh, repeal. So, you know, what could, what could be a triggering event? You know, I think uh, clearly one that comes to mind is another Pulwama type attack, and I imagine that India would blame Pakistan no matter what the facts may be, even if it's simply a case of an aggrieved Kashmiri kid, like what happened last time, acquiring local weapons and, and staging uh, an attack. Uh, also, I mean, this is, this is more controversial and certainly more unlikely, but still something to mention down the road. Um, you know, India has been, for, for quite some time, um, uh, using a lot of rhetoric in which it is threatened to, to retake um, 
we take POK. It's not new. Uh, you hear the rhetoric all the time. You've been hearing it for years. I think the, the, the frequency of the rhetoric, the intensity of the rhetoric has been quite striking to me. And when you have someone, uh, you, you've had some very senior officials, including the foreign minister, who I wouldn't think of as hardliners, who are making this claim as well. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of India trying to test Pakistan by, say, doing something across the line of c control, I don't know what that could entail, but trying to test Pakistan to see how it responds. I don't think we could rule that out um, down the road at some point during the Modi government's um, term. So, again, I, I don't expect a full-scale war. I certainly hope there wouldn't be a full-scale war. I think neither side wants a war. Um, but I think that a crisis and a limited conflict, one that could go a bit further than what happened last year with Balakot and Pawama, uh, Pawama and Balakot, that, that certainly could be a possibility. And con con conciliation would be very unlikely. So I'll, I'll wrap up now by just um, sort of saying a bit about how could we enhance prospects for peace and reconciliation. I've talked about how difficult it's going to be to expect that. How to enhance prospects for peace and reconciliation, or at least some type of thaw. Uh, so in, in the Afghan context, I think that the, the political class, <coughs> the political setup, would need to set aside all its differences and, and uh, develop some type of common front to pursue peace and reconciliation. That's a, that's a big ask, I think, right now. The Taliban would, would have to agree to work with an system that it has sought to destroy. Uh, and also reintegration would have to work. You would have to figure out a way to get um, all of these Taliban fighters off the battlefield into society, employed, all that. It's going to take a long time. That would be very difficult. Uh, with India and Pakistan, I think there could be an opportunity down the road, which I think many of us are aware of, in October. Uh, India will be hosting the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting. It's going to be in Delhi, and um, Modi will invite all of the SCO leaders. So that means that Imran Khan, uh, hypothetically, will be invited to India for the SO SCO meeting. So that could provide an opportunity. It's, it could be an ice-breaking opportunity. But I think that the efforts will be, a lot of efforts will be need to made in, in will need to be made in advance to set the stage for that before you could actually have some type of encounter. Uh, a meeting between the two leaders, or even a handshake on the sidelines of that uh, of that SCO meeting. Otherwise, I think this will just be a squandered opportunity. Otherwise, I really, at this point, don't envision any real opportunities to de-escalate on the India-Pakistan front. You know, I think that one could argue that uh, attempted CBMs have not been successful, that the Kartarpur corridor effort uh, has not improved relations between the two sides, and in fact, India has, has worried that um, uh, you know, this would be used by Pakistan to <coughs> fuel this Khalistan movement. That's that's the position that India has taken. India doesn't like it. It hasn't really taken well to it. So it's, it clearly hasn't registered as a as a CBM. And I think that the core grievances between the two sides have not and are unlikely to be addressed anytime soon. India is not going to change its policies in Kashmir. It certainly is not going to reverse its 370 decision. Um, nothing is going to change there. Um, and India will not be satisfied, it would not be satisfied with pa any with Pakistani efforts to curb terrorism, no matter how much it does. Even though Pakistan may, uh, has arguably, I think, gone further than it has before um, on a number of counts. And as I understand it, there's a plan to convict Hafiz Saeed of terrorism financing charges. The, Indi the Indians are going to want a lot more, uh, much like the Americans for that matter. Uh, they're going to want, want a lot more before they're actually um, satisfied. So, on that somewhat downcast note, I'll conclude and turn it over to you, Ralph. Thank you, Mike. I must say, possibly a very realistic prism of uh, where things stand and where, uh, how and where would they progress or likely to progress in the coming days and times. So, we uh, throw it open now. Anybody wants to comment? Ambassador Jalil Abbas Shilani, sir, begin with you. Thank you so much, Michael. I think it's, uh, you have wrapped up the two situations in a very uh, comprehensive fashion in a very short time. But a couple of questions that come to my mind. One is in respect of Afghanistan. You mentioned that uh, even if there is an agreement between Taliban and the Americans, uh, peace is unlikely to come in Afghanistan because of the number of factors that you identify. And the question that comes to mind is that in case uh, uh, the agreement does not bring peace in Afghanistan, would there still be a withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan because 
uh, a lot of people are anticipating the um, situation to get worse in case uh, the, uh, the U.S. forces are withdrawn. ISIS is already making endorsed in Afghanistan. There are uh, infighting has already begun. Uh, Iran factor is also one factor which cannot be ruled out in view of the current tension that has uh, been generated to countries. In the context of um, India and Pakistan, I think you have rightly pointed out that uh, chances of uh, a peaceful coexistence um, are certainly remote. This is certainly uh, one of the darkest hours uh, that we have faced uh, between our two countries. But uh, the question that comes to mind is uh, the possibility of the Supreme Court uh, taking a decision um, in respect of Article 370 because that's something that uh, certainly provides a window of opportunity for the two countries to re-engage. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, once uh, there is IFP a case, I was just thinking that in case the Supreme Court, Indian Supreme Court, uh, either reverses, which uh, the decision may, may be difficult for the Supreme Court to do that, but even if they suspend the decision, it can open up opportunity for it. It has the potential to pacify a large number of Kashmiris. Mm -hmm. And then it could be followed up by uh, by providing some political space to the Kashmiris. And then in a third stage, uh, revival of the CBMs that we agreed upon between the two countries from 2004 to 2008, like uh, the revival of the bus service, revival of the truck service, uh, establishment of meeting points. And then um, as a fourth uh, step, step uh, revival of Pakistan-India dialogue, including a track two or that channel to uh, maybe uh, take up the, pick up the threads from where they left in 2008. So that is something because in the absence of uh, these steps, you mentioned about a window of opportunity coming up in uh, coming months in September uh, in the shape of SCO, but in case the situation does not improve, and this is my personal view, I um, uh, don't, I am not, I uh, sure that the Prime Minister would be able to uh, undertake a visit to India because that would be seen extremely negatively by the opposition in Pakistan. That would also convey a very wrong signal to the Kashmiris and also at the international level, it would also give an opportunity to India to project mm -hmm. that as if everything is getting back to normal and Pakistan has begun to reconcile itself with the situation that is developing. So I would uh, like to um, see your views on uh, these couple of questions that have come to mind. Sorry for this long <laughs> interruption, no, no, no. intervention, and also. Uh, Thank you, Ambassador. It's always good to uh, to, to see you. Um, so yeah, I'll take the points as you as you mentioned them. On Afghanistan, yes, I, I think there's a very big chance that the uh, U.S. will withdraw forces if there's not a deal. In fact, if we get to a certain point um, down the road in the next few months and there's no deal, it, it may well happen. Uh, I think that for domestic political reasons, the president wants to have uh, uh, a fair number of troops out of Afghanistan before the election in November or perhaps even preferably before the Republican National Convention, which I think is in September or, or August. Um, and you, know, you could actually argue that from the perspective of the U.S., uh, it actually, this may sound weird, but on some level it may actually work better to do a unilateral withdrawal as opposed to a negotiated one. And the reason I say that is that, as I understand it, the administration, even though we, we, we've heard Trump talk about wanting to pull troops and all that, I, I think the administration, at least in the near term, wants to keep some U.S. troops there. Um, I think that the idea is to bring home most of them, but to keep several thousand on the ground to continue with this training advising CT mission um, in which they would not only be there, but use Afghan bases. I don't know if the Taliban would be willing to sign a deal with the U.S. that would entail that, uh, the U.S. keeping some troops there and using Afghan bases. You know, the, the Taliban has insisted repeatedly that you know, as long as there's one American troop left in Afghanistan, it's still an invasion, and that cannot happen. So in that regard, if Trump were just to sort of forget about the deal and pull out so that he could leave several thousand troops on the ground, that 
that could happen. Though, of course, the, the downside of that is if there's no deal, that doesn't set this, this pathway to an intra-Afghan dialogue, though still, it, it, it certainly could happen. Um, you know, but I think the, the impulse, the desire in Washington is certainly just to pull out. And I think that the, the relatively few prominent Trump administration officials who had the president's ear, who had supported the idea of staying, they're now gone. Mattis, Bolton, McArthur, <coughs> McMaster, you know, they're all no longer in the administration. So it leaves, um, you know, I don't think you have anyone like that there anymore that would try to get Trump to put a stop on these plans to remove truce. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I, I think it's, it, it, it is quite likely, though I do think that the U.S. does not want to do the, the, the zero option. And I think and hope that any type of withdrawal would be a phase <coughs> one. Uh, that would be much safer, I think, to go there. Um, so the, uh, moving on to India and then Kashmir, uh, you're right. Um, if the Supreme Court were to rule on the Article 370 uh, issue in a way that might uh, you know, suspend the repeal for a while, that would, that would certainly be beneficial to Kashmir, as I imagine the Indian government wouldn't want that to happen. The, the current environment makes me think that would be quite unlikely, that the Supreme Court would actually weigh in in that regard. I think an interesting thing to see with the Indian Supreme Court is if it upholds the citizenship law. That may, th there, there may be a bit more space for pushback. Though even there, I think it's unlikely. Um, you know, and I just think, you know, talking about the, the possibility for trying to get dialogue going again between India and Pakistan, I just don't think the Indian government has any interest in that type of thing right now. I mean, as I said before, it is politically, it doesn't, doesn't make sense at all. In fact, it's perhaps even costly for the Indian government to try to even think about conciliation. It's too soon. I think at least you have to look into the midterm, maybe later this year or next year. So I, I just don't see that as a, uh, as, as a possibility. And in terms of the SCO issue, I, I do agree with you. If things don't magically improve in the next few months, it would, be, it would seem to be unlikely that, that the Prime Minister would go over there. That's why I said earlier that you know, you'll need to have efforts um, starting now, really, in, in the coming months that would set the stage for some type of thaw, some type of <coughs> confidence-building effort that would put the two sides in a position where it would be politically safe for the Prime Minister to go to India. But I just don't see the moon on either side in, in favor of that. So you're right. It, it could well be that that meeting happens <coughs> and there's no representation from Pakistan or unless some low level, lower level official assent. Uh, so yeah, I think you make a good point. And just like <coughs> for India, it's politically advantageous to be hard on Pakistan. Here in Pakistan, I think it could be very politically uh, problematic for, for the Prime Minister to go over there if you still have this high degree of uh, tension. And Dilip? Thank you very much. And always a pleasure to listen to Michael, an old friend of mine, and Ralph to invite me over there and be amongst this audience. I think the points that you have put and uh, Ambassador uh, Jerry Labas has put there very valid. Uh, because he has a history as a politician. And because the success that he has gained in the elections is based on the anti-Pakistan narrative, he doesn't see any need to change. Despite the fact that there's a Delhi election, and I will ask you a question on that, that uh, they say BJP is losing, but then BJP lost last time as well in Delhi. So Delhi has never been a very strong ground this for them. It's lost by a much bigger margin much this, bigger time. Margin. this so, time. So That's that right. does not yeah. indicate... 50 to 70. So bigger margin uh, this time. This time. Yeah. Yeah. So loss in Delhi will not make Moody rethink his strategy. So that is one point that I agree with my colleagues over here. Uh, the second point which is deliberate and which I keep on asking, that it's been now six months in Kashmir for the communication <coughs> breakdown and they've been caged in their houses. How far do you think this will be taken? For example, it's, let's say, another six months. Is that possible? If that is possible, then once it is lifted, what is going to be the reaction? Because if the reaction is, which we all think it would be, then yes, Pakistan will get involved somehow or the other as a false flag operation or something like that. So, what I totally agree with you people is that as a thought out strategy, Modi will not change anything. But if the circumstances get out of his control, reserve is Kashmir, then is he going to be more brutal over there? 
Because the more brutal he is over there, the more his international standing goes down. And there is an unrest over there because his economy is not doing so well. Uh, you know, the fact that there are human rights issues which are now being internationalized, etc. So, my big question would be, how long do you think the blackout in Kashmir will last? And what will happen when he has to reduce that blackout by default or by design? Firstly. Secondly, the Afghan uh, Taliban uh, US peace dialogue. Pakistan is of course trying to facilitate it. And as you rightly put, there are too many unknown factors in it to really have a smooth sailing towards it. But what do you think Pakistan can do more to leverage its position as a facilitator uh, not only vis-a-vis the region, but vis-a-vis U.S.-Pakistan relations. Mm-hmm. Uh, so thank you. Always a pleasure. Oops. Thank you. Always a pleasure to see you and enjoy your, uh, your, your questions. They're very important. You know, qu- quickly on the issue of the Delhi election, you know, I think it is notable that, uh, as you just noted before, yeah. that the BJP lost by a bigger margin than the last time. And uh, you know that perhaps suggests that uh, you know many Indians, at least in New Delhi, are not buying into this idea of how you need to bash Pakistan at every possible opportunity. Um, yeah, that's 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 significant. So to the questions, first of all, of the blackout, um, uh, and I, I should say, as I understand it, some elements of this blackout have been eased. Uh, I know that landline phones are now usable, but who uses a landline phone these days? Um, there have been some some measures that have been eased, but. I, I don't. Uh, I I think that Modi would have a, a pretty strong incentive to keep the the black the lock the blackout in place just for the reasons that you mentioned. That uh, you know, if it ends, and then you could have when people know exactly what's going on there, they could come out in the streets, and that could cause more problems, and it could precipitate a situation where the government would crack down hard, and that would cause more problems, bring more problems to Modi's image, which is very important to him. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know, I do have contacts in, in Kashmir uh, who I've been able to speak to periodically in recent months, as some of them have been able to get out and go to Delhi, and I've been able to connect with them there. And apparently the big thing now is um, civil disobedience. Uh, that um, you know, There have been efforts on the part of the Indian security forces to try to convince Kashmiris to come out, open up their shops, so make things look normal. Um, but there's been resistance. From, from Kashmiris who they don't want to do that because they believe that things are not normal. Um, and so that suggests that if, if they do have an opportunity to come out and protest and, and try to push back, would they actually do that or would they try to do things differently? I don't know. It's, 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 it's hard to say. But, um, uh, you know, given the anger, given the, uh, the fact that, at least in the Kashmir Valley, uh, most people there are just... Um, to say the least, not very happy about the idea of becoming a formal part of a country that they hate, uh, that they, you know, they want to push away. So clearly something would have to give. Uh, I think we would have to worry about violent protests um, and more instability if, if, the, if the Indian state has to come in and crack down. So yeah, I think that the Modi, that the, the Modi government is in no rush to, do, to go any further with the lockdown. And he knows, the Indian government knows that you know, the international community has certainly been critical. So on, on a number of levels, but it hasn't really been critical. Uh, you know, in India does get a, get a pass, uh, it gets a free pass, not just from the West, but from you know a good part of the world, which which sees India as an important country, economically, geopolitically. You know, the fact that you've had some of these Gulf countries um, that have been fairly quiet about this, I think that's indicative of how they don't want to rock the boat too much with India. So the Modi government feels emboldened; it knows it can get away with what it's done. So that means. Maintaining this internet, if it means extending the, re- the world record for longest internet ban, it's, that's not going to bother. Uh, that's not going to bother the government that much, given the risks of ending it and then knowing what could happen um, from there. So, in terms of the U.S. Taliban peace dialogue, how Pakistan can do more to leverage its position as a facilitator? That's a good question. Um, I think one thing that we've already seen are efforts to um, convince the. America convinced the U.S. government that now is the time, since Pakistan has 
you know, been, been helpful and it's something that the U.S. recognizes. Now is the time to think about broadening the relationship, to focus more on trade and investment. And your, your, your foreign minister was in Washington a few weeks ago and he, he basically made that pitch. Um, I'm not necessarily sure if U.S. officials are quite ready to go there yet. They, they, I think they have a genuine desire to broaden the relationship, but I don't think they're quite ready to move into trying to talk about implementation um, and, and things like that. Uh, you know, another area to look at is FATF. I know that there's, there, there's some commentary that suggests that since Pakistan has been perceived as helpful in the Afghan peace facilitation, that makes the U.S. more inclined to not pressure fellow members of the FATF to, to, uh, to sanction Pakistan. I don't know about that. I think that the U.S. judges, you know, makes its, its, its thinking is shaped in, in FATF <coughs> shapes not by, you know, only geopolitical concerns, but also a very real appraisal of how much Pakistan has done. And I think there is a very real uh, belief in, in Washington and <coughs> the administration that Pakistan is successfully addressing most of these obligations in its action plan for FATF. But uh, FATF is another place where Pakistan can try to make a plea by saying, well, look, we're being a responsible partner. We're helping out uh, in Afghanistan. We're taking major steps um, to tackle terrorist financing. To keep, keep that in mind while you're making your decision about what to do uh, with us. Before I move on to other people, there's something that I want you to. Uh, yeah, you know, you said uh, in, in your in your presentation, you said, would the Taliban be willing to work within the political system and share power? I think this is critical. Mm -hmm. This is critical because as far as I understand, the Americans are getting out one way or the other, either with a deal or without a deal. And I think it's going to happen possibly by September or even earlier. Mm -hmm. But what, how, do you, how do you evaluate that the Taliban, uh, in either of the two events, you know, that the Americans get out, are they, are they, you know, have they changed? Would they, would they still be willing to think in terms of sharing power with other stakeholders? Mm -hmm. Or, like I said in a couple of my articles that I wrote about four to six months ago, that I feel that you know the Americans, one way or the other, are offering it on a platter to the Taliban to take over in due course of time. Not immediately, but in due course of time, maybe six months to one year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, because as I see it, when the Americans are not there any longer, there is going to be only one military force there. That is the Taliban. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the military force uh, that the Kabul government uh, pretends to be actually does not exist or shall not exist because bulk of the people who work for the military you know, would sort of cross over right. to it on, on, you know, on, onto the Taliban side. Mm -hmm. So how do you evaluate the mindset the Taliban may have undergone, a change of mindset that may have undergone, or you feel that they are the still, still the same lot that we encountered back in you know, 2000 or earlier? Right. And how is that going to impact the prospect of peace? Because peace between the Taliban and the Americans is no surety for peace in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So before we proceed further, maybe you could sort of you know, throw some light on that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, clearly the Taliban itself projects itself as a more moderate alternative to what it was in the late 1990s. Um, and you, know, you see them walking around with cell phones. And, you know, they go to mm -hmm. Doha and they go to... Uh, you know, the fancy hotels uh, in various places, and they interact with uh, with women and female journalists and all that. But um, it, it's it's hard to say. I think the best way to answer that question is to take a look at the areas, the many areas of Afghanistan that are currently controlled by the Taliban. What what's happening there on the ground? Um, well, and it's it's hard to know uh, exactly. Uh, but um, you know, there have been indications. I've heard good and bad things from those that have been able to to be on the ground. But think that when you when Taliban leaders or negotiators are asked by journalists, you know, what, you know, what, what would be the place of women in a Taliban, where, where, in Afghanistan where you have power? They're very cagey and vague. They don't really give a good answer. I know um, they gave an answer, but they said as dictated by the Sharia. Sharia. By now, Sharia who, yeah. who gives an interpretation of the Sharia? The one right. who is in power. The Taliban. And who's going to be in power? The Taliban. And that's not a good sign. That's not a good sign at yeah, all. Yeah, that's not a good sign. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I'd be very concerned for Afghanistan. And this is why the, the role of women in this whole story is so, so, so critical. Um, but I think that, you know, as I believe you alluded to before, the U.S. is in a haste to get a deal yeah, with the Taliban. I just don't think it's thinking things through. I don't think its strategy extends beyond the point where it gets that deal and it could say, well, we've got a political cover for withdrawal, we're ready to go. Um, I don't think it's considered what happens beyond that. All it said is that there, the intra-Afghan dialogue would be Afghan-led, Afghan-owned, suggesting the U.S. would not be involved. Um, so, um, it, it, to me, as I said before, it seems hard to believe that the Taliban really would want to share power. But again, it wants power. Uh, and depending on how things are arranged, if there's an, an, an arrangement in which 
you know, the, the negotiators agree that the areas of um, Afghanistan that are controlled by the Taliban now would just be formally ceded to the Taliban. Then you don't really have to worry about a power sharing arrangement. Maybe the Taliban would like that. I don't know. To me, that sounds like a dreadful idea for the country and for the region <coughs> in terms of stability. But uh, the answer to your question, I just, I just don't know um, exactly how the Taliban would proceed, but I'm very skeptical. Um, very skeptical. Dr. Pavir Sahasa? Well, uh, my question has been answered partly. Uh, what I wanted to say was that given uh, Afghan history of not agreeing to anything ever, and it's a very long history, <coughs> and given uh, Trump's propensity <coughs> to pull out a surprise, don't you think it is a distinct possibility that there will be a unilateral withdrawal? That is number one. Second, Indian economy is on downhill. Any implication there? So, uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, yes, I, I do think there's a good chance of a unilateral withdrawal. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I think that the President is very impatient for political reasons to get out as soon as he can. And I don't think he's going to wait things out if we get you know, a few months more down the road. I think he may be ready to start pulling troops. Um, and uh, you know, as, as I said before, you could argue that for domestic political reasons, the Trump may get more out of a deal that um, he, may, he may get more out of a, a withdrawal that's not preceded by a negotiation and a deal. And I should have gone into this before to, to clarify this. You know, if Trump can say to the American people, or if he could say to his rank and file, or, or to the Americans on the whole, if he can say, well, look, we're bringing American troops home, but we're also keeping a small number of troops in Afghanistan to keep you safe at home. That would play very well, I think, mm. within his rank and file. Even if one yeah. may, might contest that Afghanistan, if you had every U.S. troop leave, that Afghanistan would actually become the international terror safe haven that it was in the late 90s. I'm not sure it would be. It doesn't <coughs> change a lot. But I think that would be very, uh, that would play very well for Pakistan. And I hate to speak in these crude U.S. domestic political terms when talking about this horrific war in Afghanistan, but I do think that the calculations will be along those lines for the president. And so, you know, again, uh, you know, it, it may be hard to be able to keep several, several thousand troops in Afghanistan if you sign a deal with the Taliban just because the Taliban may not agree to that. And the economy? Oh, sorry, yes. On the Indian economy, yes, very, very serious, and I would argue that one reason why we had the repeal of Article 370 when we did, and one reason why the Modi government has been pushing this social agenda out so hard is to distract the populace from a worsening economic situation that this government has been unable to fix, was unable to fix during its first term, and doesn't really show any ability to, to stop the, the biggest problems, the rising unemployment and so forth, in its second term. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not an economist, so I'm not the best one to weigh in, but the when I talk to economists, including when I was in Delhi some, uh, last week, a lot of concern, a lot of skepticism. The, India just released its new budget, uh, as you know, uh, I think it was, that was last week. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the commentary or the, the, the feedback that I heard was that it's, it's a lot of talk, but it doesn't necessarily seem like it's going to address the, the bottom line problems. And, you know, every, every major industry in India is, is, has, has had a slowdown, right? I mean, the manufacturing, for sure. Um, you know, telecoms, which used to be a big success story, major problems there, automobiles, everything. And the interesting thing is that I think there's a connection between the economic problems and the, um, uh, the, the, the social agenda, because this is a time when India really, really needs foreign investment. There's this signature project uh, called Make in India, which is a Modi project, which is meant to draw, attract the biggest global manufacturing companies to work alongside with Indian firms and help make them stronger. But, you know, the more of these nasty scenes play out, if you've got these protests that, and, and you have uh, the, the police cracking down on them, if you have people opening fire at protests, that could affect investors' perceptions. I don't think we're there yet, but it could get to that point, and that could make it even harder for the Indian uh, government to get the investment that it really needs to help uh, uh, jumpstart its economy. Thank you, Michael. That was a very comprehensive uh, presentation and more so because I 
agree with all the points that you have raised in that. But uh, I have a few observations to make, and perhaps you can pick out the questions then and make your comments about it. As far as Afghanistan is concerned, I think at the moment, as I see the, the tempo of negotiations that is going on, Taliban are playing a pool, and I think they know that they are they have the upper hand. Absolutely. And they are going to yeah, tire absolutely. the Americans out. And they just have to wait. And, and believe me, they have a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. They can tire you out. I mean, I have spent three and a half years with them, so <laughs> one knows uh, what, how they proceed and how many they <laughs> Number one. Uh, so, so they will not be in a, in a hurry. Americans are in a hurry. And perhaps they were already, I personally thought was doing something foolish earlier on when the agreement was about to be signed. And I'm glad that, although probably not out of uh, deep thinking or something, but on an impulse when Trump cancelled that signing ceremony, it was a good thing for the Americans that happened. Mm -hmm. Now, again, the Taliban will bring them around to that. As far as handling the Taliban is concerned, I do not know what is the strength of the Taliban today. I have not seen anywhere in the news. I have seen news reports saying that their strength is about 60 to 70,000. Yeah. When Taliban were at their <coughs> apogee, apex power, when they were in control of 80% of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. their total strength was 20,000. Mm -hmm. With another 2,500 or so from Pakistan, were volunteers from Pakistan, and 2,500 the IMU characters who were there. How is it possible today that when they were running the shots, they were they were they could not get recruitment? I know that they were they, they were the tribals, but <coughs> even including Mullahumar's village, refused to give further volunteers for fighting the Jihad. What is the reason that they are getting more volunteers today? Mm -hmm. What is their strength? Number one. Number two. We keep talking about the Shura, the in, the U.S. intelligence, and more so. <coughs> The NDS, which spends most of its resources spying on Pakistan and <laughs> doing things against Pakistan, they should concentrate more within the country to see what are the thinkings of the various commanders. Because at the moment, it is not the same kind of a situation where Mullah Omar had complete authority and his word was obeyed. Mm -hmm. Today, I suspect that the field commanders would, would have their own ideologies and thinking, some hardliners. And as it was in the past as well, I mean, Akhtar Usmani was a uh, total mullah, uh, but he was, he was a more, more sort of soft person and enlightened kind of a person. Mullah Razak was a brute force person. So you know, this, this is very important because this will be particularly important because once the intra afghan dialogue starts, and that intra afghan dialogue again will pose difficulties because I don't think the Taliban will agree to talk to the government alone. It would have to be government as one of the factions yes. and not as, a, as one of the authority. To me, I mean, I find, I find the situation in Afghanistan about the same as it was in 96, 97, 90. Mm -hmm. Taliban knowing that the, the government authorities are all different factions. Commander Atta has his own, own satrapy. Dostum has his own satrapy. The others are you. And uh, Afghanis have their own areas, uh, the, the three, three provinces. So they, they think that they will never unite to fight Taliban and that they will individually knock them off. So the situation is going to be very bleak and Pakistan is going to suffer as a consequence because it will create a lot, lot more refugee influx into Pakistan and nothing else. So I, uh, Americans will have to, even if personally, I think it sounds totally illogical and against the way the negotiations are going. But they have to make it very clear that they are not going to quit. In fact, they are going to increase the force. Or else persuade some of the NATO countries to contribute. And for God's sake, all this trading and money and all that, they should, they should uh, commit. If the Americans want to get out for electoral considerations as well. Mm -hmm. As far as India is concerned, I think <coughs> India is, I think Pakistan, there are no chances of a dialogue at the moment. They, Modi is not going to relent. And it's going to create a lot of difficulties in Pakistan. And lot you mentioned about uh, Modi visiting Lahore. It was not a gesture of friendship. It was, I think, what he had in mind was thumbing his nose at the Pakistan military. Mm -hmm. He flew to Lahore without any information. 
We had High Commissioner Liu at the last moment and barely made it to the airport in time. He went straight to Nawaz Sharif's <coughs> house, attended that wedding ceremony and the birthday and all that, and drove back straight. A normal courtesy in diplomatic relations is that when you are overflying the territory, you transmit a message of goodwill to the people of that country. Mm -hmm. There was no such thing done by you. Mm -hmm. he, was, he did not even mention, you know, he, didn't, he did not have had a press conference or anything. He should have at least released two liners that I convey my good wishes to the people of Pakistan from the people of India. Mm -hmm. But nothing was involved. So I don't think that was a gesture of goodwill. If anything, it was a gesture to embarrass the military in Pakistan. That look, I'm talking to that people that they would not uh, consider you of any consequence. At the moment, the way things are, the, he, he has no other option but to keep a tight control and release it ultimately, slowly, maybe another six months, another eight months, or ten months. But the Kashmiris, in my view, and whatever little I have talked to people across the board, they, they, would, they are not going to take it lying down this time. The Hurriyat leadership is not as effective as the younger generation that has come. Mm. They are going to do something, and India is going to manufacture incidents, like they did in the past. I hope they, they, what was the name of that police officer? No, no, police officer, Devinder Singh. Oh, Devinder yes. yeah. Singh. Let, this, let them, I mean, the, it's already clear that Afzal Guru case was a false flag thing. The uh, Pulwama was a false flag thing. The parliament attack was a false flag thing. Even if, if they were Pakistanis, why would a, a hardcore terrorist, which has the, who have the competence to attack the parliament go all the way, would be carrying their identity cards with them and Pakistani biscuits, made in Pakistan biscuits. They, they, if you recall, at that time, that is what they had said, that they, they were carrying made in Pakistan biscuits. I mean, it was, it was a false flag operation. And I think if they investigate the Vindas thing, he was involved in that operation also. Mm. It would, it would uh, now again, on the NOC, Modi will have no other option but to heat up things just to distract attention from the troubles. All those troubles, the civil disobedience that is going on is getting gaining ground. Economic condition is poor, it's getting worse. Although it's not as bad as Pakistan's, but nonetheless, it is going to deteriorate. And he will have no other option but to do certain of these things, saying that Pakistan is doing acts of terrorism and put pressure on Pakistan. So I think international community has to do something in order to help safeguard the situation. Otherwise, then some some strike or balakot style type of misadventure or whatever, they will he will be forced to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and and this has to be and unfortunately the international community has been pathetic as far as the Kashmir to say the least. So I, I I personally feel a very very gloomy scenario as far as both Afghanistan and India. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so thank sure. you. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, great point. Um, so the first question about Taliban recruitment. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good question. Uh, how is it able to be maintained and increased? I guess uh, several reasons. Uh, one, certainly xenophobia. Uh, you know, Afghans that just don't like the U.S. to be there. And I would argue that the U.S. unfortunately is starting to wear out its welcome, or over the last few years it started to wear out its welcome. You know, you look at the U.N. figures on civilian casualties, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, you've had uh, over the last year or so, um, I believe, or the first half of 2019, I don't know if the figures are ready for the last half of 2019, you know, more civilian deaths from, um, uh, from actors aligned with the Afghan government or sorry, more violent, uh, more deaths from Af from the U.S. Go uh, the Afghan government and the U.S. than from the Taliban. That's really significant, uh, hugely significant. And you hear you, you're hearing a lot about drone strikes that are killing civilians, and so I think that could be a radicalizing factor that could be causing people to, to join the Taliban. The economic uh, imperative certainly is something else. I mean, you're promised a paycheck, you get on time, and you may get paid better than, and more regularly than if you were to join the to become a, a soldier in the Afghan military. That very different type of, of reason, and I'm sure that could be something too. But finally, I think the big one is just the governance issue. Um, you know, the the Afghan, the, the, the national unity government was particularly unpopular and particularly unable to provide basic services, deal with corruption, 
and all that. And you know, I think that a, a critical mass of Afghans believe that the Afghan government was not a better alternative than the Taliban. And so they were, some of them were, were, were willing to accede to these entreaties of the Taliban where they say, well, look, we're clean, we deliver swift justice, we'll provide you with a paycheck, and so on, and you know, in contrast to the Afghan government. So I think that's, th those are some factors uh, right there. So in terms of the, the Afghanistan uh, situation, I, I agree with you, it's just going to get really, really messy, really ugly. I, I just don't think there's an option that the U.S. is going to, uh, to, uh, yeah. to, yeah, I think that the U.S. is going to leave. As I said, I think it's going to keep, it's going to want to keep several thousand troops there. It's not going to want to surge more. It's definitely not going to want to do that. It's just politically impossible. And there's bipartisan support for that in the United States as well. That's simply not going to happen. Barack Obama was very much opposed to staying in Afghanistan. Whoever becomes the next president is going to want to get out. I mean, to the extent that the candidates have talked about Afghanistan, um, none of them have said that we want to stay. They've all called for a negotiated uh, agreement. And I do think this, this, this Washington Post series on the Afghanistan papers, I think, sort of woke up Americans on the whole to the realities of the Afghanistan mess with all these, these terrible stories about U.S. policy. I mean, those of us that study Afghanistan, we knew this was happening. But to our Americans on the whole, you know, there are at least those that read the Washington Post, you know, they're learning about how troubled this, this mission is. And again, that's just going to increase the support for some type of, of, of withdrawal. Um, and in terms of India, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say it really what's going to happen down the road. I think mean, to accentuate what I said before, that the relations are probably going to stay tense for, for a long time. I don't know. The, the situation with that police officer, Devinder Singh, is very bizarre, very interesting. I don't know if anyone knows the full story. Um, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of speculation and theories about what was going on. You know, perhaps one uh, suggestion is that there was some sort of like a communication breakdown. <coughs> and what he was really trying to do, this police officer, is he was, you know, working for RAW or something. He was trying to cultivate uh, relations with these with these militants, and that someone, you know, others didn't know that he was doing that, and they decided to arrest him. I don't know, but um, you know, we can't rule anything out. Um, and I think that the bottom line is that the, yeah, the, the Indian government, this Indian government, really ha has no interest, uh, no incentive uh, to try to slow things down um, or to, to try to ease the, the tensions with with Pakistan. If we have this conversation a year or two years from now, maybe enough time would have gone by that there could be some push away, but we're not there yet. Sure. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Gugelman. Dr. Gugelman? No, I, I wish. Uh, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> we have been after a very long time. But yes. That's uh, another, another, another story. Yeah. It's been a very interesting discussion. I will feel a little too polite, very diplomatic. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not a diplomat. Oh. I'm not a bureaucrat, so let me oh, that's fine. say a few things. One can play a little game. What do you expect the Taliban to do? Because they believe they were ruling the country. They were ousted by the USA. So let's go a little further. The USA came in. And now you say they want to go back, something or the other. Has the USA ever left a country where they came in? Any base that they've ever vacated? Never. Then let's go back 80 years, this book by Arnold Toynbee, Study of History. He says when this sort of conflict happens, there's only two ways the weaker party can react. The Herodian way, the way of Herod, the king, or the zealots. Mm. And this is what the Taliban claim, that you are all psychopaths, agents of the imperialists, etc., etc. We are the ones who are fighting for freedom. Also, the Afghans have never been ruled by other people. On the other hand, if I were, if I had ruled of Afghanistan, I'd never let it go. Two reasons. One, very strategic position. You can have an influence on Iran, Central Asia, and of course, troubles for Pakistan, everything. Plus, it is the Saudi Arabia of lithium. 50% of the world's lithium resources are there. Mm -hmm. And this is the same thing when you talk about renewable energy, <coughs> batteries, Lithium comes. I never let it go. Mm. Uh, we talk about the uh, withdrawal of American troops, a partial withdrawal or maybe majority withdrawal and some people left there. What about the contractors? Mm. What about the FSG? 
What about Eric Prince and his mercenaries? They outnumber the NATO and US troops. And now Eric Prince, I, be, I understand, has a very close ear of the president and is writing and talking about the new East India Company model. That, he says, is what we should do in this area. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of trouble ahead. And I think there will be more. Uh, another question about occupation and so on, or whatever you, you want to call it, uh, making people come into the 20th century, etc., etc. Which people have ever got the freedom through negotiation in the last 50, 60 years? It never happened. Mm -hmm. Forget this year. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Now, about India and Pakistan, the BJP. We assume that BJP is the is the enemy, of the nasty face, and so on. But all Indian uh, governments have had a very, let's say, uh, uh, antagonistic view of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Remember Indira Gandhi, the Congress, when Dhaka fell, what did she say? We have now arranged 1,000 years of history. And that is the psychosis, that is the psychology which is driving the Indians. They just can't get over 1,000 years of when they were ruled by foreigners, majority of, uh, most of the time by the Muslims. So this psychological attitude is, is terrible. And I do not foresee, I do not see any peace coming between the two, India and Pakistan. The only thing keeping peace at the moment are nuclear weapons. That's all. Mm. Nothing. And I'll share something with you. In 2004, we had the 100th anniversary of the Rhodes Scholarship. I was in Oxford, and Bill Clinton was there. And I had a long chat with Hillary Clinton. And I said, thank you for the Pakistani bomb. We are a very lazy people. The Indians did the explosion. They had three reactors, not a single one under inspection. Pakistan had only one power reactor in Karachi, under inspection, international agency, Canadian reactor. What do you do? Shut up our spare parts, shut up our fuel. The Indians kept getting their fuel, their spare parts, everything. So then, younger people said, let's do <coughs> something, something. Change the control room completely from the old valve to solid state. Everything, nine, ten years, so people mm -hmm. got ambitious. Had the complete fuel cycle. <coughs> we never have gone on this route if we had got, kept getting spare parts of the Karachi reactor. Mm -hmm. So things, you know, it's a little bit like game theory. Mm -hmm. Now, we'd like it to be win-win for everybody, but it doesn't come out like that. Mm -hmm. Not in international politics, not in power politics. Hmm. Sure. Go. Michael. Yeah, thank you. No, some great points. Uh, great points there. Very interesting. Very provocative. Um, uh, no, I, so your question is about precedent. Has the U.S. ever um, left the country completely? No. Um, you know, has anyone got freedom through negotiation? No. Uh, I think that the, there, there's one <coughs> analog that many analysts use when describing a case where there was a successful negotiation that brought peace to a country after a long insurgency, and that's okay. Colombia. Colombia? Colombia, yeah. Now, of course, it took, what, 55 years <laughs> to mm -hmm. negotiate a deal? Uh, something like that. And I think that gets to one thing, that it takes a really long time to do these things. And so, you know, if you want to talk about an intra-Afghan dialogue, I think it would need to be measured in years or decades, not, uh, not, uh, not months. So, sorry, let me just mention also mm -hmm. that I'm not a great fan of the Taliban. In fact, I suffered in their hands. Mm -hmm. I was head of a university in the KP province and I had to leave mm -hmm. when threats became too serious and too frequent. Mm -hmm. They were not Taliban. They, they said they <laughs> Taliban, American <laughs> Taliban, Pakistan, but Dan Khane Khana should know. <laughs> <laughs> I put my vote there, he should yeah. know. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yes. Like. Oh, yeah. Um, but you never had a president like Trump. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah, that's true. Um, so the question, <laughs> the, the question about the BJP, yeah, they've always been antagonistic toward Pakistan. Yeah, that, that could well be true. But I think that this current BJP has gone much further than the la you know, other, the previous BJP government, the Vajpayee government. is a different breed altogether uh, than what we're seeing now. Um, and it's true that you know the Article 370 repeal has been on BJP uh, documents and election manifestos for quite some time. Yeah, but only now did they actually follow up on on that uh, on that threat on that vow. Um, and in terms of the thing about the only your, your point that the only thing keeping in 
peace between India and Pakistan as nukes. Well, that's true, but you know, what's a bit troubling is that uh, in recent years we've seen an increasing willingness on the part of both sides to fight the limited conflict under the nuclear umbrella. Right? You know, what, what happened with Balako? Even if we can test what exactly happened with Balako, you know, it, it was the first time uh, that uh, India had used airstrikes uh, in uh, in Pakistan proper for you know, for a very long time. And Pakistan, lot of, lot of course, casualties on the Pakistani side. Many trees were destroyed. Right. No. Exactly. Yeah. No, th there wasn't, in terms of kinetic damage, there wasn't much. But th no one denies that there was air power. Indian air power was used there, and Pakistan did its own response. I mean, it was. I guess there was bombed a, an empty area somewhere. But the use of force, retaliations, even if it's rather modest, it's ha it happened under the nuclear umbrella. And what we have to worry about is, as I said before, if there's another crisis, the relationship is in so much worse place than it was the last time, meaning that it will be harder to de-escalate, and the higher you go up the escalation ladder, the closer you get to the nuclear ceiling, and then you really have to worry about it. This is dangerous. Yeah, that's dangerous. Right. This is, this is dangerous. Anybody else? Anybody else? With the, sir, the one in the back, sir. I think my question has been answered. It has more to do with FATF. I mean, for last one year, Pakistan was under a lot of pressure. And the pressure uh, seems to be that maybe Pakistan has done some practical mm -hmm. measures, but it could also be maybe Afghanistan or whatever. It seems like that the U.S. is now much softer than it was you know, <coughs> six months or a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and so I do you think we are, we'd like it to move out of What's your perception? You'd like it to move up like this? And yeah, well, it won't, it, Pakistan will not be on the blacklist. That's, I think that's quite clear. That's not going to happen. Um, but it, it, it can't get off the gray list yet, as I understand it. They're having this meeting, what, next week? Uh, next week. Um, and, you know, there, there, there are things that can be done, but it's not a time where they could be taken off the gray list. That would have to wait for the next meeting. Um, but, I mean, the important thing is that it's not going to be blacklisted. And as I said before, I, you know, I, I spoke, you know, I had some meetings with senior U.S. officials before I left for the South Asia trip, and, um, you know, they were all very optimistic, not optimistic, they were encouraged by uh, what Pakistan had been doing uh, per its obligations to its action plan in FATF. Much more encouraged, much more positive than sometime, you know, some months ago, as you just suggested. And I think it's, it's because, it's not necessarily just because it's grateful to Pakistan for the help it's brought to Afghanistan and it wants to reward Pakistan. It doesn't only work that way. It really has to weigh the situation and look at what Pakistan has done. And I think that there's a, 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 a per se recognition on the part of the U.S. that um, it has done a fair amount. Uh, it's made more progress than it had some months ago. And of course the U.S. is just one member in, in FATF, but it's, it's the U.S., so it's powerful. So I think you could hope, you could expect that uh, the U.S. will try to impress its view upon other member states and hope that they, they side with the United States. So I'm fairly optimistic about uh, Pakistan's prospects. I'm not sure it'll come off the gray list when it's time for that. It depends on the type of progress it's making. But it's not, it's not going to receive the ultimate sanction. It's not going to get blacklisted. I'm, pretty, I'm quite confident about that. Sure. So maybe small comment. Can't hear you. Speak a little louder. Okay. Actually, uh, you have received that uh, the peace prize is uh, basically guided by Taliban and the US. But actually, you forgot about the incentives of the other regional partners. For instance, Pakistan is sharing power with Afghanistan. So, uh, uh, what, what is my question is uh, how the incentives of Pakistan can be incorporated in the peace uh, process of Afghanistan? Second, so India has done a huge investment in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So what about uh, the, uh, the, what be the possible impact on the investment uh, of, of Taliban coming into the power structure? Because it has not been presented that the uh, Taliban uh, are uh, in the hands of Pakistani agencies. Mm -hmm. And third, uh, what about the incentives of Iran? Taliban are presumed uh, the Sunni majority in, uh, in Afghanistan, and uh, also it will definitely they will have an uh, impact on the Iranian policies. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, thanks. Those are three good questions. So the role of Pakistan and its efforts in the uh, in the talks. Well, you know, as I, as I understand it, uh, Pakistan was very helpful early on in the process when it came time to convince the Taliban, uh, <coughs> the key Taliban members, to physically go to Doha to. to 
talk to, to American negotiators. And I think that what really the big thing for the U.S. was something that really was um, well received by Washington was the release of <coughs> Mullah Bar Baradar from prison. That was a big deal because uh, he went, he was, he became a top negotiator. That was very significant. I think that was a big ask from the United States, probably delivered under a lot of pressure, and it happened. So that was that was something that really contributed. Um, beyond that, I really don't know the full story of what Pakistan is doing now. I, 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 I do know that the uh, in previous months, the U.S. government has tried to get Pakistan to urge the Taliban to reduce violence, to provide more space for, for talks. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that continues to go on right now. But uh, that's basically what it, what it comes down to. Um, and I, you know, I should say that this may be a bit of a controversial thing to say here, but we should not overstate the assistance that Pakistan has played in the, in the, in the, in the talks in Afghanistan. Several reasons. One, the Taliban had always wanted to talk to the United States anyway. They had always demanded bilateral talks. Uh, and, and the other thing is that um, the, the U.S. was willing to launch talks with the Taliban on terms that were very favorable to the Taliban. You know, the Taliban did not want Kabul present. The U.S. said, okay, that's fine. The Taliban, at least earlier on, did not want to talk about uh, Afghan dialogue, ceasefire issues, and only wanted to talk about a troop withdrawal. And the U.S. said okay, because it didn't have the leverage to demand otherwise. So, in other words, you know, the, Tal the Pakistan was urging the Taliban to join talks that it was already uh, keen to join under terms that were very favorable to the Taliban. So I, that's, I would just um, uh, put, that, put that out there. Um, in terms of India's role in Afghanistan, I know this is controversial. Indeed, India has done a lot in Afghanistan. It's one of it's a top uh, uh, contributor of, of development assistance. There is the strategic partnership accord between the two, India and Afghanistan, that goes back some years. I forget what year, 2011 or something. Earlier than that. Earlier than that. Earlier than that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, I know that here there's a view that Afghanistan, uh, that India is doing a lot more than providing development assistance in, Afga in, in Afghanistan. You know, India is very interesting. I talked a lot with my Indian uh, interlocutors uh, about, when I was there in Delhi, about the Afghanistan story. They're just very concerned and skeptical. Uh, on the whole, they believe that no matter what happens, they're going to lose out. If there's no deal, uh, if the war intensifies, that'll make it difficult for them to be present in Afghanistan, working with the, the Afghan government. If there is a deal, uh, if there's a peace deal, a comprehensive peace deal, they, they're, that's something that they're not, I mean, they, they, they support the idea of a negotiated outcome. They do support that, but they don't support the talks as they're going now because of this view, which I think is accurate, that if there's any type of deal, it would mean that the Taliban would be in a position of power, and they don't want that. That worries them. So they're very concerned. Um, you know, it is interesting. In, in previous months, there have been one or two cases where you had some unofficial Indian uh, representation at some of these unofficial meetings hosted by other countries. I think in Moscow, Moscow hosted a, a round of, of informal talks between the Taliban and other stakeholders, including Afghan stakeholders that were not a part of the government. And you had two retired Indian diplomats, right? Yeah, one a former Indian ambassador to Afghanistan, but they were retired. They were in their unofficial role. So it's almost like Delhi is trying to test the waters as to what it can do, how involved it could get. But I think so long as Pakistan has a role, India's role would necessarily be, um, be limited. Um, I, I do not think that India would do what President Trump has asked it to do and what I believe perhaps Kabul has asked India to do, and that is to provide truce. Uh, I think that even for this Indian government, which is so willing to go further than other Indian governments. I think that's a red line even for the Modi government. They're not going to deploy troops to Afghanistan. There have been some, some reportage in the Indian press, uh, which the Afghan government violently rejected right away, that the National Security Advisor, uh, Mohib, had gone to New Delhi uh, some weeks ago requesting troops. Uh, and and, and it, was, it was rejected right away by the Afghan government. By the Indian government? No, by the Afghan government. Oh, the Indian government. Indian. Yeah, sorry, sorry, my apologies. Okay. So that, that's, um, but at any rate, uh, India, India is very worried, but I think they feel that their hands are tied. But certainly, if the war gets out of control and you have all these different <coughs> countries, Pakistan and others, trying to secure their interests, then certainly India will do what it feels it needs to do to secure its interests. With Iran, very interesting point. I've been following this very closely about Iran's stakes in Afghanistan, which are very complicated, but very important. Um, 
you know, Iran for many years has, I would argue, played a, a double game of sorts. Um, the, the Iranian government has, has pursued uh, close ties with Kabul for quite some time. Uh, the Iranians are very helpful to the United States, in fact, soon after the 9-11 attacks, uh, when you had um, the U.S. preparing for this offensive in Afghanistan, Iran, and, as I understand it, provided valuable intelligence to the U.S. about the location of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Iran played a big role in the uh, Bonn Agreement, which hashed out the first post-conflict government in Afghanistan. Uh, but Iran, it does. It, you have to. I think you have to look at Iran's situation in Afghanistan through the lens of the U.S.-Iran relationship. And as the relationship has gotten worse, uh, you started to have cases of Iran providing episodic levels of military support to the Taliban, um, uh, and I think that's that's fairly well documented. It's not a tremendous amount, but it's it's there. Now, with the in this post, you know, after the assassination of Soleimani. The U.S.-Iran relationship became really bad, and I think we can all assume that Iran will be periodically retaliating against the United States asymmetrically in the coming years. And one, you know, possible option is for it to scale up its support to the Taliban, um, to while the troops are still there, to punish U.S. troops. You know, also there is this um, this uh, Shia militia uh, that's been present in Afghanistan, also to a lesser extent here. It's comprised of Shias and Hazaras in Afghanistan. They had been used by, by Tehran, and Soleimani cultivated it to, uh, to help achieve Iranian goals in Syria, but it's been disbanded for now, but it's, it's still there, and you could argue that perhaps Iran could try to reconstitute that, that militia to go after U.S. troops. Um, but uh, the, I think Iran is very cagey, it's very careful about how it, how it goes about this. I think at the end of the day, Iran wants more stability in Afghanistan, not less, because it has the same types of concerns that many of the other regional players do. ISIS is a big concern for Iran, of course. The drug uh, situation is huge. Uh, Iran has major issues. The heroin uh, epidemic, much of this is sourced from, from Afghanistan. You know, refugee flows is another concern. So Iran has a strong interest in there being some type of peace process and a peace deal in Afghanistan. But I think so long as the relationship with the U.S. is troubled, it's going to try to poke the U.S. in the eye, or worse, uh, to the extent uh, to the extent that it can. And keep in mind that the Soleimani's replacement, whose name I forget, the former deputy head of uh, the Quds Force, he had headed the Afghanistan and Pakistan operations of the Quds Force. Yeah. So he knows this. He knows this. He knows the terrain, especially Afghanistan. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, what do you think? Uh, then the emerging threat of ISIL pushed the Taliban to join hands with the other factions in ethnic group, including the government uh, in Afghanistan to fight against ISIS. So, sorry, your question is the what ISIS they, could mean? Could, could it be uh, a big enough threat yeah. for mm -hmm. Taliban right. so that they can join hands with the government and other mm -hmm. groups in Afghanistan? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, as you know, probably the Taliban even now is fighting the ISIS on the battlefield and doing pretty well, as I understand it. Um, but uh, yes, I, I think that one of the more bizarre hoped for outcomes of a, of a deal with the Taliban is that the Taliban would become a counterterrorism partner of the Afghan government and maybe the U.S. Uh, forces, if they're still there, to sort of uh, comprise this huge force to go after the remnants of ISIS. That's a bit risky, especially if you're trying to disarm the Taliban and maybe get a little, uh, get a bit tricky. But certainly I think that, as I said before, ISIS is would not be involved in a peace process, a uh, peace and reconciliation process. And, um, you know, I, I do think that it could win out by a, a peace process because you'd have the hardline Taliban that would want to join it. Uh, I mean, the, the, the flip side is that if there's a deal, the Taliban would work with, with other interesting partners to, to go after ISIS. But I think that ISIS could still win out. I, I do worry about ISIS or Daesh or whatever you want to call it. It's been hit hard by airstrikes for so many years now, but it's still there. Not as active, doesn't seem to be carrying out as many attacks, but it's there. I, I do think that some uh, players over-exaggerate the threat that it poses. I mean, the Russians have said there's like 50, 60,000 ISIS fighters. It's nowhere near that amount. Yeah, it's more like 10, 15,000 at the most. Yeah, maybe not even that many. I, mean, I think the U.S. estimates have it. It's quite significantly lower, uh, like a few thousand. Anyway, um, but no, I, I think we do have to be concerned about ISIS for the reasons I mentioned. Can you make a quick comment? Yeah. You mentioned the IT industry in India. 
there is a major change happening now in the last seven, eight years. Mm. The software back office operation and software development, the cheapest countries now are the East European countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And within uh, Asia, in Asia, so let's say, Pakistan, India, and China, Pakistan is cheaper than India by about 40, 50 percent. Mm. Interesting. That's Things a great point. The ways. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Thanks for that. Sorry, I'll just take this for a minute. Martin, thank you very much for your time and your wonderful appraisal of uh, the threats in the region and uh, the feeble prospects for peace, which actually do exist, which we need to work on to augment them. Uh, the situation is it's not very bright, it does not look very bright, and I don't think there are any prospects of uh, immediate or midterm improvement. But anyway, once again, from our side and from the side of everyone who has taken part in this dialogue, we're very grateful to you. Thank you very much. And Radeem Sir, very grateful to you for your time, for your for your cooperation, for your support, and for having arranged all this. Mm -hmm. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Such a pleasure. Thank you, folks. Good Let me just quickly say, over to you. Let me just quickly say thank you to everybody. I think it's been a great discussion. I'm often troubled by it. Um, all these wars that are taking place in the Middle East, I think you talked about India, mm -hmm. Pakistan, we all this close to a war. But interestingly enough, the nuclear lobby has been proved right, despite mm -hmm. what I heard today. Uh, it seems that the nuclear lobby was right, and maybe we did the right thing in getting the nuclear bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, I'm an economist, what do I know? <laughs> but, you, had, you had your pick from the conversation, <laughs> and you did the right thing. <laughs> you, guys, you guys sort of discuss these things a lot, but look at the whole of the Middle East. Mm. And from Syria to Libya to everything, everything is a mess, yes. despite so much con sort of contemplation of foreign policy. That's why Iran wants it. I mean, you know, but uh, Iran uh, also is correct. You said that Iran is going to indulge in asymmetric warfare over there. I think, but looking at it from a game theoretic point of view, Iran is playing the right game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the U.S. can play that game, who can play the yeah. game? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the question is, with all this foreign policy stuff, mm -hmm. what do you guys get into? Why should Pakistan just draw? and get into economic development. That's my mm. take from this. <laughs> if only we would get that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but as, uh, you know, <laughs> Sir, the biggest amount of research money mm -hmm. in the developed country, less than USA and Russia, goes to defense religion. Mm. Yeah, that's that's true. True. About more than 50% in the USA. Yeah. So they yes. support wars in the world, so that is why. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. they have to So run. anyway, folks, this was a great <laughs> session, and that's what we are here for in Bite. We like to arrange these things because I think it's important for us to learn and it's important for the whole of Pakistan to learn. So it was, thank you, it was uh, very nice of you, Michael, um, Michael, to come here. And we'll continue to discuss things further. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rav Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.